Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And um, I'm Simon Martin, and I'm the director of Pallant House Gallery in Chichester. Um, this evening, I'm going to take you very quickly through some of the works that we have in the Pallant House Gallery collection. And um, I will be talking you through a number of works that we have in the collection. These, um, these include six works, six key works. Pallant House Gallery is one of the leading collections in the regions in Britain of modern British art. And um, the collection and the museum opened 40 years ago next year. So in 1982, it first opened and it's in um, a unique combination of an 18th century Queen Anne townhouse and a contemporary wing. This is the exterior of the building. And as I say, it's a Queen Anne townhouse um, built in 1712 with a contemporary extension by um, Long and Kentish in association with Colin Syndrome Wilson. And as I take you through, this is the courtyard garden that we have, which was designed by Christopher Bradley Hole in 2006 with the contemporary extension alongside. And one of the key things about Pallant House Gallery is the juxtaposition of historic and modern side by side, this extraordinary kind of combination in the city, in the center of the historic town center of Chichester, which is a cathedral city on in Sussex, in West Sussex, in the south coast of England. Um, and I'm so pleased um, that we're now able to be sharing the courtyard garden with our visitors again. In the foreground, you can see a sculpture. If you look very closely at the top of the pole, a sculpture by Tracy Emin, her Roman standard. Um, the interior of the gallery is a series of domestic spaces, panelled interiors in the 18th century house. And here, for example, you can see sculptures by Andy Goldsworthy using chalk from the South Downs and an abstract painting from our collection of modern British art by um, Sir Terry Frost, um, which is part of the collection that came to us from an artist called George Dannett, who was an abstract artist. Um, the these interiors, former domestic interiors, are combined in by a new wing on the other side of the building. Um, here we can see an installation by Pablo Bronstein in on the staircase of the 18th century house, an installation called Wall Pomp. And that, that conversation between historic and contemporary is a very important part of the experience as you go around the gallery. Now, here you can see the almost TARDIS-like effect of coming into the new wing of the gallery and here some of the pop art collection and I'm going to be talking about one of the pieces from the pop art collection this evening. The first work that I'm actually going to talk about though is a work by the Italian futurist artist Gino Severini and it's a work dating from 1915-16. Of course it's not a work of modern British art, but um, of international work. And in fact, one of the things that people often don't know about Pallant House Gallery's collection is that we have a very strong collection of international works. And that includes pieces by um, the Cubists, so examples being works by Georges Braque, uh, Pablo Picasso, um, André Derain, um, through and, and impressionists and post-impressionists, so artists such as Paul Cezanne um, and um, um, Edgar Degas and, and others. Now, this work by Gino Severini came to the gallery in 1989 as part of um, a collection known as the Cayley Bequest, and he was a local collector and property developer um, who acquired a lot of the international works in the gallery's collection. And what, of course, we see here is this extraordinary um, example of movement 
and modernism. And of course, it's a can-can dancer in Paris. Now, Gino Severini, as I said, um, was from Italy and he joined the Italian Futurist Group, an avant-garde group of artists at the invitation of um, a poet called Tommaso Filippo Marinetti in 1910, and he signed their manifesto. Um, they were obsessed with movement, with machine forms, with modernity. In fact, they, they, they were against museums and history, in fact. But um, whilst some of the Italian futurists um, depicted a lot of uh, machine forms, moving trains, hurtling cars, things like this. Severini was much more interested in the subject of the ballerina, the dancer. Now, he, during the 1910s, was living in Paris. Um, he knew Picasso. He, his fellow Italian artist, Amadeo Modigliani, was, a, was another friend. And they would go to the dance halls um, of, of, of uh, Montmartre. This is actually a photograph of Gino Severini when he had his first solo exhibition, actually in London, um, at the Marlborough Gallery in London. I mean, you can see his distinctive appearance here with some examples of his works in the background. And I think it's quite important to show this because actually um, it's important to remember the relationship between European art and British art during the 20th century, that British art has never been in a vacuum artists from from abroad have come to Britain and British artists have gone abroad and and movements like the vorticist movement in Britain were very influenced by the Italian futurists. Severini in turn um, was thinking about that history of the can-can and here we have um, a print by Toulouse-Lautrec of these high-kicking um, chorus girls with their kind of frilly petticoats being raised up high. Severini does something different um, to artists of such as uh, Toulouse-Lautrec. What you have is um, he's drawing on the language of Cubism and Cubism of course sought to, to, to depict not just one dimension, two dimension, three dimensions, but four dimensions, trying to get a sense of time and movement. And so you have two different views of that face. You know, on one side, you can see the lips at the top right hand side. And, and as she grabs her leg, kicking high, this explosion of colour. And in a way, the, the figure and form become entwined. And one of the other things which Severini takes from the language of Cubism is the way that artists such as uh, Picasso and Braque would, would, would emulate real life materials such as wood grain and often they would use collage veneers. In this case he's actually painted wood veneer in um, to show the days on which she is dancing. Um, so this painting um, as, I, as I mentioned has a extraordinary history. It belonged to an American collector called John Quinn in the 19, from 1916 to 1926. Um, and, and he had one of the best modern art collections in America. And then subsequently it passed through various hands and ended up with us in Chichester. The next work I'm going to show you is quite different. Um, and, and actually I, I wanted to show how um, Severini has influenced um, artists in our collection and this is um, a work by the German artist Lothar Goetz who's based in Britain and he created this extraordinary composition for a staircase, a mural, and he looked at Gino Severini's The Colours at the top left hand corner in Severini's Dancer. The next work is a portrait and, and in a way this work um, moves between the tradition of portraiture, grand portraiture, and um, embracing modernity in the 1930s. It was painted by an artist called Glyn Philpot, and um, I have a strong personal connection to this work because actually when I was a student at the Courtauld Institute of Art in um, back in 2001, I wrote my dissertation about Glyn Philpott and about his work in the 1930s. And when I first went for a job 
um, interview at Pallant House Gallery, there was this work on loan. Um, and, and I subsequently got to know Glyn Philpott's niece and she then um, bequeathed this work to the gallery. And so it's kind of been with me at the gallery during my, my career. Now, one of the things about Philpott was he was a hugely successful artist in the 1910s and 20s, one of the highest paid portrait artists of, of his time. And in fact, when he was elected, he was the youngest royal academician. He was working in a very traditional style, painting portraits of society figures, everybody from the Duchess of Westminster to King Fuad of Egypt to Siegfried Sassoon and Dame Nellie Melba, these incredibly grand, um, rather showy portraits. But in 1929, his godson, Oliver Messel, the theatre designer, um, met Henry Thomas in the National Gallery. And so the story goes, Henry um, was a stoker on a ship and he was originally from Jamaica and had missed his ship home. And he was there, I, I think, sleeping in the National Gallery. And he was introduced to Philpott as a possible model. And I've got a photograph of um, Philpott here in the foreground in his studio with Henry Thomas, um, interesting, holding the easel in, in uh, alongside. And in a way, Henry became a kind of muse to Philpott. Um, he was depicted in numerous paintings during this period, and I'm going to show you um, one of his drawings. And, 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 and Philpott was an incredibly skilled draftsman. This is one of his drawings of Henry. And here, his painting, Balthazar, which is in a private collection. And, and one of the things um, which I think is particularly um, noticeable about Phil Potts' work is, is, is how he honoured his sitters. And of course, the, 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 the history of portraiture um, is about taking notice and honouring the sitter, taking the time to paint them. He was fascinated by... Henry's um, skin tones and, and the, the question of how to de depict those together with a modernist kind of colour frame. And in fact, in 1930, Philpott took a studio in Paris and it was a modernist studio. And there he depicted um, black cabaret performers in Paris in black tie, in these extraordinary modern interiors. and. Um, when he exhibited these paintings, his first paintings back in London, the, the newspapers declared Philpott goes Picasso. It was a kind of it was a, a kind of a scandal in a way of this very traditional artist embracing modernity. Um, it's also, I think, important to, to recognize that Philpott was a gay man working in the 1920s and 30s during a period when, of course, it was illegal to be so. And I think it's fascinating how in his career, these questions of diversity, he as a gay man, but also this, the way that he um, was drawn to honouring sitters such as Henry. And I'm currently working on a book about Philpott for an exhibition at Pallant House Gallery. And there are fascinating letters and archives and sitters, sitters records in Phil Potts um, log books of, of how Henry would go to the studio for, um, for these sittings. The next work I want to look at is quite different, an abstract work. And this is a work by Ben Nicholson, um, almost just over 10 years later. And Ben Nicholson, of course, together with artists such as Henry Moore, Barbara Hepworth, Ivan Hitchens and, and others was one of the key abstract artists working in the 1930s in Hampstead. Um, and throughout his life was drawn to working with still life um, as subject matter. His father had been the painter, William Nicholson, who was also famous for his still lives. But, but whilst in a way that was a formative influence on him. Nicholson um, was drawn to the modern throughout his career, drawn to um, abstract work and 
tearing things down. And in a way, this is a particularly colorful work for Nicholson. He was interested in the object quality. And in the previous decade, he had started carving white reliefs, carving out the surface. And, and here, there's no sense of carving, but he's made the frame himself. And he's almost painted this suggestion of a kind of stone or wood table with an arrangement of still life objects on top of it. He'd been looking at Cubist artists such as Juan, Juan Gris um, and others. Now, if you look at this work, you start to pick out certain forms, a bottle that runs through the red and the kind of taupe color and the blue and the title 1946 still life Cerulean. Cerulean is a name for a particular blue. Um, you can also see um, pencil drawn um, arms and goblet forms. Um, here is a photograph of Nicholson in his studio um, in 1935 by Humphrey Spender, you can see what is probably the basis for that bottle because it appears in various different works throughout his career. And even later on in 1982, after um, he'd been down to St. Ives um, where he worked and then on to Switzerland and he returned to Hampstead. And you can see some of these distinctive forms that form the heart of Nicholson's work. The next piece I want to show is a work by Nicholson's um, life partner, or at least for part of his life, Barbara Hepworth. And they were partners. They, they married in the early 30s. They had triplets um, and, and moved together to St. Ives um, at the outbreak of the Second World War. They subsequently separated in the post-war years. Barbara Hepworth, of course, has become Britain's most important sculptor together with Henry Moore. Um, and both of them um, tackled similar questions around making sculpture. They worked with something called direct carving, working directly into the block of stone or the wood rather than molding and getting, um, and, uh, but, so, and, but they also engaged with the question of piercing the form. And this work is called Single Form Nocturne. Um, and of course, the suggestion of a kind of moon, moonlit kind of subject. And it's made in Irish black marble in, the, in 1968. And here is a photograph of Barbara Hepworth in her Truin studio in St. Ives um, with a piece from a few years earlier. I mean, this sense of the connection the, to these organic forms. One of the things which fascinates me about this particular sculpture is, is the axis. And on the left of the sculpture, if you look at the left-hand edge, it has a very sharp edge. And on the right-hand curving arc on the right-hand side, it's, it's similarly sharp, but in the center is this soft edge. And as you look through, you can't see a single way through the form. And um, she'd started making these curved, these carved sculptures in the early 30s. This is an alabaster form, which is now um, sadly destroyed. Um, but it's, it was said that she was thinking about these uh, kind of mythical qualities of Menatol um, curved stone sculptures in Cornwall. And she said that she thought of um, these, these pierced stone sculptures as a fusion of experience and of myth. Um, and she, she felt that working in an abstract way enabled her to kind of release um, something of her personality in her work. Now, from the same date, 1968, um, I'm going to talk about another work, but first I want to quickly show you um, the person who acquired this work, and this was Walter Hussey. He was the founding collector who was the Dean of Chichester Cathedral. And um, together with works such as this Barbara Hepworth, he acquired works by Graham Sutherland, Henry Moore, John Piper, but he also commissioned modern art for the cathedral in Chichester. So there you can see this extraordinary John Piper altar tapestry, an altar by Graham Sutherland, a stained glass window, um, by Mark Chagall, and he also commissioned music by Leonard Bernstein and others. And this 
extraordinary sculpture. I'm going to show you a, a photograph of it in situ with the light coming through that hole. He actually, um, Hepworth made it for him after a conversation about what he looked for in a sculpture. And he went to collect it in a fishing net from St. Ives. And of course, now we have it here in the gallery. But from the same date, 1968, is a very different kind of sculptural artwork. This is a work called Swinging London by Richard Hamilton, um, made in 1967 to 1968. And it actually depicts something from pop culture. It's, but it's, it's, a, it's a construction. What you're seeing is a, a frame that suggests a police van window. And it depicts a key moment in the 1960s, which actually happened in Chichester. The red in the background um, to the left of the figure is actually the Crown Court in Chichester. And in 1967, there was a party at which the Rolling Stones attended, Mick Jagger, and it was held at um, in the Witterings, which is a small village near Chichester at the home of Keith Richards, a member of the Rolling Stones, Marianne Faithful, um, the, 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 the kind of performer was there, model and performer, and various others. And also um, the art dealer, Robert Fraser. And Robert Fraser was one of the key art dealers in the 1960s. And he had shows of artists such as Peter Blake, whose work you can see in the background. In fact, the one on the left is now in the Pallant House Gallery collection, but also artists such as Patrick Caulfield and, and Richard Hamilton, amongst various others, including Jan Howarth, the sculptor. Now it's Robert Fraser and Mick Jagger depicted in this artwork here um, because they, at the party, the police turned up and um, they were taken to prison and then appeared at Chichester Crown Court. And the judge declared a swinging sentence. He wanted to make an example of them for drug taking. Richard Hamilton, though, felt that it was punishing people with drug addictions. And he was, he was fascinated by the press coverage of, um, of this incident, this lurid press coverage. This is a print that we have as part of our collection of pop art at Pallant House Gallery. And you can see that he's taken um, the photograph um, of Richard, uh, of, of, of um, Mick Jagger and Robert Fraser in the back of the police van and he then screen printed it and painted over it and then created this extraordinary relief. There's a whole series of these works and the final one is in the collection of Pallant House Gallery. And this, this is the work and you can see how he, he added colour tones to certain elements such as Mick Jagger's lime green suit and the red of his lips. The final work I want to talk through is the architects. And this is a work that belonged to the collectors of this pop art collection that came to Pallant House Gallery, Colin Syndrome Wilson and MJ Long, his American wife. Um, and Colin Syndrome Wilson was known to his friends as Sandy Wilson. And um, he and MJ were the architects of a number of projects, um, including the British Library, um, to, with, together with MJ's company, Long and Kentish, with Rolf Kentish, and also of Pallant House Gallery's extension. But they were huge um, collectors of pop art and figurative art and great friends with a lot of these artists. So Richard Hamilton, who we've just seen, was a great friend. Peter Blake, Patrick Caulfield, Eduardo Paolozzi. And here we have a work by R.B. Kitai. MJ designed the studios of a number of artists, including Kitai, Peter Blake, Gordon House, and Frank Auerbach. And what we see in this portrait is the interior of Kitai's studio. And if I go on here, you can see um, one of the preparatory drawings. And one of the great things about the collection that Sandy and MJ um, gave to the gallery was, was how rich it is in preparatory drawings and in prints. They were interested in um, the works on paper that relate to the paintings that give you a greater understanding of how an artist thinks and how an artist works. 
You can also see in the background their children, Harry and Sal, um, looking looking through in the for um, in, in between them, um, and both Sandy and um, and and RB Kitai were great bibliophiles, and it was rather appropriate, of course, for Sandy to go on to design the the British Library, which he was working on at the time this painting was made. But you can see the bookcase staircase that MJ designed in his studio, which of course appears on the right hand side of um, this painting. Now, one of the things about this painting was it was also, it was about their friendship and it was about their relationship. And you can see that MJ is wearing a, an American football um, top, which is actually one from Yale University. And um, you can see um, here on the left-hand side where the colour scheme comes from. This is the Night Cafe um, by Vincent van Gogh. And, and Sandy was teaching at Yale University where he met MJ Long, who was one of his students who then came to work with him in Britain. And so the background colours, the red and the yellow lamp and the kind of yellow flooring was Kitai's own homage to that relationship. Um, embedding it in art history. And I love that connection with works. And I've one of the great challenges this evening um, was to select six works out of 5,000 things that we have in the collection. And, 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 and trying to work out which of those things which have interesting stories to tell when everything has a story to tell. But these are just a kind of starting point, really. And what I would encourage you to do is to come to Pallant House Gallery, um, come and visit the permanent collection and the exhibitions. And I'd like to say a huge thank you to Art UK and to Bloomberg Philanthropies. Thank you.